Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Today we're going to repair and restore a really neat old radio receiver from way back when. The receiver is made by RCA Victor. It has a really unique look to it. So together, electrically, we're going to make this radio receiver work again. And then in the end, we're going to test out its performance. So this should be a lot of fun. The official 2020 Mr. Carlson's Lab calendar has been released. And the calendar is photograph quality. If you're interested in checking that out, I'll put the link just below the video's description under the show more tab. So just below the video description is a show more written in capitals. If you click on that show more, it'll expand, click on the link and it'll take you right to the calendar and you can check it out. You can flip through the pages and see all the pictures in the calendar as well. So let's get started with this restoration and let's get this radio working again. Here's a closer look at the front of this very interesting looking RCA Victor radio. Every time I look at this, I always think of a ceiling vent. That's what it reminds me of. Very interesting design. I imagine way back when they figured that this would affect the sound and we'll find that out when we restore this radio. So all in all, it's in really good shape. One of the things I noticed is that it has these knobs on the side. There's two on this side and one on this side. And this one's for the tuning. And as you can see, it's a really shallow type of knob. So as you're turning this, your fingers are rubbing up against the case all the time. It would have been nice if they would have made this just a little bit longer so it'd be easier to grab onto because it's pretty much, you know, you're doing this with the thing with two fingers. And in this case, it is rubbing up against the case. So we could probably use some form of a felt washer or something behind that. And on this side, there's another two. So this is radio and phono right there. And we'll have to find out what this does. Let's see what this does. Well, there's all sorts of settings here. So that's phono and then it goes click, 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 click. Lots of different positions, maybe tone, something like that. This is probably the volume control. We'll find all this stuff out on the back side. Let's get this out of the way. Cord's a mess. I don't know if you can see that. Try and get that close to the camera there. This is to certify that this instrument has the acoustical balance which produces the tone of the golden throat. And that's a signature of some sort. It looks like D.D. Cole or something like that. Chief Engineer, Home Instrument Department, RCA Victor. Very interesting. Produces the tone of the golden throat, whatever that is. It just sounds strange. The cord itself is a mess. You can see this here. It's coming apart. Definitely needs to be replaced. And since this is an All-American 5 type radio, It'll definitely need a polarized plug. The rest of the cord itself isn't in that bad of condition. It's just right around the plug here. It's looking a little bit nasty. So what I'll do is I'll get a screwdriver and I'll open up the backside and let's take a look inside and see what we find. I've removed all but one screw on the back side of the radio here, which is this screw right here. So there's only three other screws. So I'll remove this one, and let's see what we find inside this radio. Here we go. You can already see the speaker through the top side here. And look at that. It's in very nice condition. Lots of dust to be expected throughout the years. The antenna on the back side is in very nice condition. The whole back side here is in very nice condition. Speaker looks very clean. I don't think there's any tears in it. When I remove the chassis and all that stuff, we'll find out if the speaker is nice and clean. There's a lot of areas I can't see from this angle here. So this is a classic All-American 5 style radio. This would be the mixer oscillator right here. IF amplifier tube. This would be the audio amplifier and detector tube. That would be the audio output tube. So this drives the speaker. And this would be the rectifier. So this takes the mains, so this takes the line and changes it to direct current. And then this would be the filter for that. And that powers the whole radio. And I see a bunch of dial lights down in there, a dial light. 
There might be one on the other side as well. So everything is really clean in this. Just, you know, dusty and dirty it looks. So I imagine to get into this thing, on the bottom side, there are four screws. So I'll remove those four screws and then these knobs on the side, they should just pull off. So I should be able to pull them off like this. And we'll take a look at the underside of the chassis and see what we're up against to get this thing restored and operating again. Before I start removing all the screws on the chassis and removing the knobs and things like that, I want to make sure I can get this antenna out of the way without damaging it. So these are very fragile and of course the tape on the backside is getting pretty old right now. So I want to desolder this wire here and the other antenna wire which attaches to the variable capacitor. This is what I'll do. So I'll gently remove the oscillator tube here. Get that out of the way. And I'll grab my soldering iron. And hopefully they haven't wrapped it around the post. They haven't. That's nice. A little bit of a bend in it, but that's about it. This one, I don't think they were as nice. There's that one, okay, so that should come out. There we go. So hold this so the antenna doesn't fall on the floor. So there it is. The antenna is off. I didn't want to risk damaging this piece of tape here. End up pulling on these things and it'll just tear the tape. So this is in really nice condition, the back side of this thing. As you can see. It's not often you find radios like this in that kind of condition. Usually the backs have been off of these things so many times and so many people have been inside these things with screwdrivers and that because the parts are failing over the years and they figure by turning these coils that they can resurrect the radio again, which is absolutely false. So the speaker is just plugged in. And just pull those out. And see if I can get a small screwdriver. Not so small screwdriver, but this will probably work. Right down in here, I don't know if you can see that. Let's see if I can get this into the shot. I'm using rolls of solder to hold this on an angle so that we can see inside this thing together. Move these out of the way. Maybe get that there. You can just barely see that. There's a little bit of a notch down there. Put this here and this here. That'll probably hold it. So if I stick this here, Instead of me just pulling on the knob, I can give it just a little bit of a twist. That's going to be a little easier on things. There we go, so I don't damage the knob. That came off real nice and easy. And I'll do the same for this side here. Get this all out of the way. It's a little easier to see on this side. Put that there. That should hold that up. Just a bit of a twist. Just like so. Last thing you want to do is pry between the case and the knob, because if you do that, a lot of the times you'll break the knob. You can see how thin this material is. Be a good chance that that would break. And this one over here, let's see if I can do this. Get this all in the shot. Just a bit of a twist as well. There it is. That just comes straight off like so. And then on to the bottom side. Need a quarter inch. Which is usually very common. These older radios. There it is. It's nice that all the original hardware is here too, so this radio looks like it was kept very well. I'm just holding the radio so that this doesn't fall forward. You can see it's already falling somewhat in, so. Hold this just like so. Of 
And hopefully there's no other wires in here. And just like that, the chassis comes out. So what I'm going to do is get the case out of the way. And then I'll turn this thing upside down and in the next shot, we'll see what's on the underside and what we're up against. Here we are on the underside of the chassis and the radio receiver looks like it's almost all original. This capacitor here is a little bit out of place. So I imagine early on in this radio receiver's life, chances are one of these wax capacitors ended up shorting out and they replaced it with this Astron capacitor down here, which is by now bad as well. So all of these capacitors here, if you were to test them with a capacitance meter, chances are they would test close to their value, but they would test a little bit high. And that's because these are slowly changing into resistors. So what happens over time is what's inside these capacitors ends up decaying and it creates a thing called leakage inside the capacitor. Now, when I say leakage, I'm not talking about a physical substance like oil or anything like that. They electrically leak. So capacitors are only supposed to pass alternating current or AC, but when they leak, they're turning into resistors. So they start to pass DC. And when they pass DC, they load circuitry, and what they end up doing is they'll pass DC from one stage to the next and cause biasing issues with tubes and all sorts of things. And, of course, that burns out components, so we definitely don't want to power this radio up without changing these things out because these are definitely bad by now. And I'll give you an example here in just a little bit. I'll compare some of these to newer capacitors and show you how bad they actually are. So when people tell you, they say, you know, don't turn on the radio unless it's been repaired or it's been looked at. It's very true. What ends up happening, this is the main filter capacitor here, and that's that large capacitor that's on the top side of the chassis. What happens is, is they very often go bad, and if you plug one of these radios in, what happens is the capacitor usually shorts, and what it'll do is it'll blow the cathode bonding wire off inside the rectifier tube, so it destroys the rectifier tube right away. And that's all because this big old electrolytic capacitor is grumpy by now and it doesn't want to do its job anymore. So that has to be replaced as well with some modern capacitors. So all in all, when I look at this radio chassis here, I see this, I don't know what this is. This looks like some form of shielding or something that somebody's put on top of another capacitor. It looks like some wound wire wrapped in black tape. So there's there may be a capacitor hiding in here. We'll take a look at that here in the next little bit. So all in all, all of these capacitors have to be changed. So this has to go, this has to go, this one has to go, this Astron has to go, this has to go. If there's a cap in here, it'll have to go. This one will have to go. So all the red capacitors, this one, this one, this one down here has to go. And that electrolytic capacitor, which has three electrolytics inside one, has to go as well. So what it'll end up doing is probably mounting a terminal tie strip on the bottom side of the chassis. And I'll just leave the old capacitor on the chassis for aesthetic reasons so that it looks like it's all original from the top side of the chassis. So it just looks better that way than removing it and having a big hole in the chassis, right? Now people say, well, why don't you restuff it? Well, I could go about restuffing it, but what's the point? This way, it just sits there. It can be removed if it ne ever needs to be removed for any reason. And all the new capacitors on, are on the bottom side of the chassis and they're very easily replaceable. When you restuff these things, it becomes a real pain to fix them if the capacitors ever go bad inside the, the shell that you've restuffed. So that's just making extra work down the road if it ever needs to be worked on again, which the capacitors I use are extremely high quality and I, I doubt they'll ever need to be replaced again, but you never know. This is a ceramic style capacitor here. This does not need to be changed. Whenever you see these ceramic capacitors, most of the time they're good. Sometimes there are capacitors hiding inside these IF transformers here and they go bad. They have a thing called silver mica disease and they sometimes you get silver migration. So it really depends on the environment that the the little transformer in the entire radio chassis has been been in. So if it's been in a moist environment or you know, it's you know been in an attic where it's, you know, I guess you could say exposed to the elements where it hasn't really been temperature controlled, maybe in a garage or you know damp basement. A lot of times silver migration happens in these things and the the IF transformer needs to be pulled apart and the capacitors that are hiding inside need to be replaced. So when I look and look at this thing, I don't see any caps 
surrounding it. So there's most likely caps hiding inside here. So when the radio is powered up and we listen to the radio, we'll be able to tell by the strength of the signal and we'll be able to see if both IF stages are, or the IF stage is working correctly. Looks like they have Allen Bradley resistors in here. So Allen Bradley resistors are the resistors like this. These are carbon composition resistors and they have the squared off ends on them. So this one here is a roundy. So this isn't an Allen Bradley style resistor. This is one of the porous body and moisture ingression can get inside these things and cause them to drift in value. So I always test these things. If it's close to its value, I'll leave it alone. This thing looks like it's been kept in a temperature controlled atmosphere. It's just in such good shape. So I imagine it's probably going to be okay. These resistors with the porous bodies, again, if it's, you know, in a garage or something like that, a lot of the times they move all over the place. Whereas these squared off end Allen Bradley type resistors, they end up lasting for a very, very long time. So quite a bit more resilient to, you know, dealing with moisture aggression and things like that. Let's see. So all the rest of them, they all seem to look like Allen Bradley's. All these resistors have all the squared off ends on them all over the place. This is the only roundy style looking resistor. You have this one over here too, which is interesting. 300 K ohms up over here. So yeah, as I say, you know, this component looks out of place. This one possibly out of place. Other than that, it really looks original. So what I'm going to do now is start removing these capacitors here and replacing them. So I'll replace all the waxies and then I'll go after this uh, electrolytic one in the end. Also find out what's going on inside this interesting looking black taped thing over here. I have one end of this capacitor desoldered. So it was soldered to this terminal right here on the tube socket. You can see that I've removed the tube out of this socket right here as well, just so I don't heat the pin of the vacuum tube. Now, usually there's enough thermal decoupling between this area and the actual pin of the tube. So if you forget and you leave a tube in and you do some soldering, it's no big deal. It's not going to really hurt anything. I've done it a lot, but it's just good practice to pull the vacuum tube out when you're soldering. So what I'm going to do is desolder this end over here. So what I'll do is just get my soldering iron in here and heat this up. Sometimes it's beneficial to add some solder. There's a lot of solder on this terminal right here. So it looks like it's getting hot. And I can see that this one here is wrapped around here, just like so. It comes out just like that. So now when you're putting your new capacitor in, it's always a good idea to take note of the outside foil end. This band here indicates the outside foil end of the capacitor. A lot of newer capacitors don't display the outside foil end. It's just an entire body and there's no line on it indicating what end is which. So I'll explain the outside foil end here in a bit. So this capacitor goes in like this. It's a factory install, so I'm sure that this is going to be the right way. So the outside foil end will go to this terminal right here. And you can see all of these capacitors have an outside foil end and it's clearly marked outside foil underneath the wax. At least it should be at any rate. Let's scrape some of this off. You can see that right there, outside foil. So when you're replacing these capacitors, it is important for you to locate the outside foil and install these the correct way. Again, just a little bit, I'll show you how to locate the outside foil. So I'll replace this one here and then on to the next one. I'll go one component at a time. So I'll get a bunch of these out of here and replaced and I'll be back. All the paper and foil capacitors and the electrolytic capacitors have been replaced. So all the yellow capacitors that you see all over the chassis here and some that you're not seeing have all been replaced. So they've replaced all of those red paper and foil type capacitors. Now there's a capacitor inside this pipe here. So what this pipe is, is a whole bunch of coiled wire really tightly wound. And then what they've done is they've taken some black tape and put that on the outside of the wire just to hold its form. This is an actual factory part and they're using this as shielding for the capacitor, the capacitor that runs from the volume control over to the tube socket here. Because it's a long suspended run, it would pick up hum. So the coil that's on the outside, the insulated coil 
that makes up this pipe is grounded as to act as shielding for that capacitor. Kind of interesting. I managed to dig up a schematic for this thing. I actually had one in my files. We'll take a look at that here in just a little bit. And it shows this piece right here acting as shielding. So I slipped another capacitor inside here and soldered it to the volume control and to the tube socket and just used this piece. No point in replacing it. Nowadays, if you were going to do that with a capacitor, what you would do is cut a piece of coax cable, pull the center conductor out, so just the shielding is forming a pipe, and then you would put the capacitor in the center of that, and then just ground the shielding out, and that'd be a much faster way of doing that. But back when, this was the solution. Two new electrolytic capacitors are installed here. So this is double-sided molding tape, and that was just to hold the capacitors to the chassis here. Well, I took some wire and formed it, now this is very rigid wire, this is number 14 wire, and it's a very short run between the capacitor and this little portion of the tube socket here. And what this is doing is this is actually holding the capacitor. These number 14 wires, there's one here and there's one over here, that has a very short run, and then this wire here and this wire holds the capacitor in place. So really the double-sided tape was just to hold it here while I soldered these wires on. If I was to take a knife and cut through the double-sided tape, the capacitor would sit just like that. So it's just a little bit of, I guess you could say, extra holding power to hold the capacitors in there. This is really good double-sided tape. The molding tape that they use on cars to hold moldings on is very, very tough. So these are installed on the underside of the chassis here, and they're good for the long run. I took a lot of extra attention when I was bending the wires around the terminals here to make sure that there was no downforce or any force on the capacitor itself. So I would form the loop and then push the loop over the terminal. Pretty much if you were to, if this was the capacitor terminal, the loop would just go like this and it would sit on top. And then I would solder it to this. So there's no you know, pulling on these things or anything like that. So this is not going to separate from the chassis anytime soon. The way it's sitting is the way it is and it's extremely tight like this here. It just won't move. It's part of the chassis now. So a nice easy solution to put some larger capacitors in here because the capacitance value of that capacitor is actually very large because of the circuitry design here and because of what they've done. And I'm going to talk about that when we take a look at the schematic here. So these are 400 volt rated capacitors. These are really overrated, but I like to do that. And these are very high hour capacitors. So these will last an extremely long time at 105 degrees C. You know, these are designed for modern switch mode applications. So, you know, being put into service like that is, you know, pretty much torturing these capacitors all the time, right? So they're very, very tough capacitors. So these things here will be good for the long run. I don't imagine that they'll probably ever come out again. Now you'll notice that there's some wires running from the capacitor, which looks like it's tying into the old capacitor, but they're not. The old capacitor is completely disconnected, and what I've done is I've used the little terminals that come out of the capacitor to hold these standoffs right here. And I've shown these in a bunch of my videos. This is a little ceramic standoff, so this is soldered onto the old capacitor lug, so the bottom portion here is. I'll tip this up in a moment, you might be able to see that a little better. And then all the wires that were soldered to the capacitor lug were just moved up to this point here because there's a lot of measured wires and everything in this area. So moving it up is a very easy solution. And then I just tie this to the new capacitor. And that's what I've done. See if I can get a better view of that. You can see that little ceramic standoff right there and see at the bottom how it's soldered to the capacitor. So basically what's happened, let's see if I can put this down here. So basically what's going on is the capacitor lug right down in the bottom here is just bent over kind of like an L shape and then this is soldered onto that and then all the wires are soldered onto the top side here and that's with both lugs. Now there's three capacitors you can see I've trimmed this one off and that's because that's a lower value and a lower voltage capacitor and that's actually put right across the cathode resistor that runs to the, let's put this back here that runs to the 50L6 tube. And that's the resistor right under there. Let's see if I can move this over just a little bit. So there's the resistor there, 150 ohms. And this is the capacitor right here. 
right down there that is across that and that replaces the capacitor that's inside there so that's a nice thing about modern components is most of the time they're quite a bit smaller so you can tuck them in different places and clean things up quite a bit new line cord is installed here brand new line cord and wired into the switch and just a lot of time spent on the underside so since the last shot to this one here this is about eight hours about eight hours between the two so through the magic of the camera it's like seconds but quite a bit of time goes by when you're working on this i took the time to spray contact cleaner in the volume control and this little multi-position switch here and clean them up real good now what i'm going to do is i'm going to get some stuff out of the way i'll flip the chassis over and i'll show you what i'm going to do next and i'm going to do uh, that particular portion while i'm working on other things because paint is going to have to dry before the next shot what you see here is the dial back plate and the needle rides on this plate right here and you can see it's kind of a an interesting looking red color and that red is very pitted and I can just touch it with my fingernail and I can scratch the red off as you can see just ever so slightly this is just from it rolling around on the bench I'm just touching that and that's what you see there is just bare metal on the underside so I want to paint this now it's very easy to find a paint that looks just like this you just go to an automotive place and usually they have touch-up paints for all sorts of different types of vehicles and this would be a very close match to some of the touch-up paint that they had in in a lacquer so if I wanted to spray this the same color I could do that but I don't want to do that because this color that's on this back plate here makes this needle hard to see most back plates are black and i have no idea why they've made this that red color obviously maybe to aesthetically match the radio or something so by painting this flat black will really make this needle stand out underneath the dial plastic which is somewhat of a light pipe so you're probably saying what's a light pipe well here it is so this is the dial and you can see how these they kind of look like they've got a gold color to them and the only reason they look gold is because of this little bit of gold they've painted on the ends if we look at the back side there is absolutely nothing in these little either they're either punched or engraved areas there's nothing in them it's just right through but that gold that's on each side makes it shine through here so what happens is is these two dial lights that you see here fit into this area right here and it'll make a really nice display to light this up and make all of these little numbers glow now if you look through this you can see that red color on the underside so this would actually sit about like that so you see that red color on the underside now you can see how much better you can visualize this how much better these numbers and everything in this needle would stand out if that was a black background like every other normal back plate so i'm going to get rid of this color here what i'm going to do is just spray this a flat black color and that should really enhance the look of this as well so i've got to get that done because this is going to have to set up while i'm working on other portions of the radio this here is in very nice condition all i need to do is just clean it up so the little scratches that you see on the end here are from the actual clips that hold this in in the actual radio itself on the bottom side so this is out of the viewing area those scratches so it will look very good i think that's really neat how that just putting that little bit of gold on each end makes it shine so nice into all those little numbers there should look really nice with the lights shining into this before I remove this dial back plate, what I want to do is fully mesh the tuning capacitor. So that means that all the plates are inside one another. And I want to take some tape and put some tape across these areas where the dial string is coming off of this main dial here. So that way, when I take the dial string out of the pulleys, not everything is going to unwind and it's going to be a real big pain to put back together. Any of you that have ever played with a dial string on one of these radios, knows what a pain it is to well, restring a dial so what i do is i use gorilla tape i got a whole bunch of gorilla tape and i've cut some small strips so what i want to do is right where this starts to come off of the main pulley what i'm going to do is cut a little strip 
Make sure the area is de-dusted because obviously dust is going to affect the way this stuff sticks. And what I'll do is I'll put a little bit of Gorilla Tape right there, just like so. And that will hold this one area. Now, I also want to do the same on this side here. Since I'm going to be leaving this thing fully ganged, what I want to do is put another piece right down here. So I'll put one right here. Of course, this is going to be a pain to get off, but getting the tape off is mild compared to having to restring a dial. I'm going to also want to put some just right over top of this right here, right over top of the drive. So what I'll do is I'll take this strip right here, so this way it won't unwind off of the drive. Let's put this here like so. Doesn't have to be pretty as long as it just holds it like so. And I think that's about it. So if you think that you're going to forget whether this runs over the top or on the bottom, and the same thing, you know, with these here, whether it goes over here and then up over the top or over the top and over, over the bottom. What you want to do is take some pictures of this or just draw it out real quickly before you do that. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to remember this just fine. So what I'm going to do now is take the dial lights off. Have to test those out as well. Very often in these series sets these dial lights are gone and it looks like these two are actually in series so it goes here into this bulb and into this one here should be an interesting number so now since these are off what I want to do is I'm just gonna leave the needle on like this and if I need to adjust this I'll do that later so I'll just move that off like so and then take this off of this pulley right here like so and like so, and then of course this will just fall off as well, right? And I'll just put this back down. I got a quarter inch nut driver. Move that. And remove this. And I'm pretty much ready to repaint this. So I'm going to clean this up, repaint this, let this set up. And while I'm doing that, I can clean the chassis up here and get everything all nice and cleaned. Here's some capacitor knowledge that you can use to impress your technician friends or engineer friends or musician friends or just people that are into audio. So audio guys seem to think that these older capacitors, so these are paper and foil, okay? So paper and foil, not to be confused with paper in oil, there's paper and foil capacitors. A lot of people seem to think that these capacitors make their amplifiers sound warmer, or in some case, if you have an old radio, it even makes the radio sound warmer. Well, you wanna know something? They're right, they do make the radio or amplifier sound warmer and consequently they also operate a lot warmer as well with these things and I'll explain that here shortly. So what's happening here? So what's happening is you can picture a resistor in parallel with this capacitor. That's this capacitor's failure point. All of these capacitors are in some state of turning into resistors. Okay, so you can picture some high value resistor across this in parallel, and that's basically what's happening. So we have a capacitor here, and then we have the effect of a resistor across this. Now, what's that doing? Okay, so if we take a look at the schematic for this actual radio that we're working on here, I can use this as an example. Okay, so I'll just zoom on in a little bit here. So we'll look at this capacitor here. So this is in an amplifier stage right here. We have a pre-amplifier here, right? We have detector, audio frequency amplifier, and we have AVC action within this tube. So this tube is doing three things, okay? So we're gonna focus on the audio frequency amplifier portion, which is this triode right here, okay? So our audio signal is coming up this line here, going into the grid of this tube, okay? So what's happening is, is we're getting amplification inside this tube. So the sine wave that's present on this right now is 180 degrees out of phase at this point right here because it's being amplified, okay? 
So when I say 180 degrees out of phase, what happens is you can see we have a plate resistor right here. Okay. So what's happening is when the signal on this goes positive, if we were to look at this like DC, when the signal on here goes positive, it pulls the plate towards ground. Okay. When the signal goes to negative, it lets that voltage climb back up again and go positive again. So basically what's happening is when the sine wave at this point here is going up, What's happening is the voltage is going down at this point because the tube is starting to draw current and we're getting the opposite effect. So whenever you're dealing with vacuum tubes, the vacuum tube basically is taking the signal that's on this point and recreating that signal here 180 degrees out of phase. Okay, so if we put another one of these triodes over here again, that signal would be in phase again because it would be 180 out and then 180 back in again. Okay, so what's happening here is we have our audio signal going into the control grid of this tube. This is a triode, so we only have one grid. This C shaped thing at the bottom is a cathode, and on the top here we have the plate, so that's the anode of the tube. And as you can see, we have 66 volts on the anode and that's being dropped through this resistor right here which is our load resistor in line with the plate of the tube so this capacitor here the failing capacitor so one of these again so say this capacitor right here is the failing cap and consequently this cap would be in circuit this way the line side always goes to the lower impedance portion of the circuit okay line side plate is the lower impedance portion so what's happening here now, since we have a resistor across here, okay, so just say, for argument's sake, that this capacitor here had dropped to 470k ohms, okay, so we have a, a fictitious 470k ohm resistor right now across this 0 0.01 microfarad capacitor. So we have 470k here, and then we have 470k to ground. Well, what would that create? That creates a thing called a voltage divider. So if we have 66 volts up here, what would we have at this point if we had that 470k ohm resistor across here? Well, we would have 33 volts on pin 5. Pin 5 is not supposed to have any DC on it. As you can see, we have 470k here, right? Right to ground. The way that they are biasing up this tube here is they're lifting the cathode above ground by this 150 ohm resistor this is how this tube is biased it's by the cathode so by lifting this above we get 5.5 volts of bias here okay so this is 5.5 volts on the cathode here and that is creating the bias for this 50L6 tube. So whenever you see a resistor in line with a cathode running to ground it's there to bias the tube since this is lifted above ground, that looks like negative 5.5 volts on the control grid. All right, because it's lifted above ground. So this looks negative. Negative 5.5 volts are very close to on pin number five here. So now here's the thing. If this capacitor is turning into a resistor, say the same value, that's a pretty high value, 470k ohms is you know, getting up there, right? You know, we're almost halfway to you know, one mega ohm. So say we had 33 volts on this, well what's going to happen to this tube? Well since this is the control grid inside this vacuum tube, what it's going to do is it's going to control the tube. It's going to turn this tube on. You'll notice that we are supposed to have a negative voltage on here, right? So if we had a positive voltage on pin 5, it starts to turn this on and it allows the tube to conduct. Now the whole idea of the 50L6 tube is to drive this audio transformer, okay? So what it's doing, this audio transformer is basically transforming impedances. So we have a high impedance on the vacuum tube side, but the vacuum tube needs to drive a low impedance load, which is the speaker. So this basically is, you can look at it as transforming impedances, and that's the reason why the transformer is in an audio circuit like this. High impedance device controlling a low impedance device right here. So what's going to happen is this tube is going to start to conduct heavy, 
All right, so it's going to really start to draw a lot of current. If we put a positive voltage on the control grid here, what does that do? Well, basically we're going to run into a thing called excessive plate dissipation, and not only that, you, you'll start to see the actual plate of the tube. The plate, if we look at one of the, the tubes out of this here, the plate is the outside areas, the, the outermost metal part inside this tube. You can see it's got a little, a little flap right there. That is the plate of the vacuum tube. Now, when these coupling capacitors start to turn into resistors, a lot of the times you'll notice what's known as a cherry spot on the plate. You'll start to get kind of a, a reddish-orange spot on the plate, and that means that the tube itself is drawing too much current. The actual plate is starting to glow red. Now, granted, a lot of vacuum tubes, when the plate does have just a very, very slight cherry spot on it, they sure seem to sound nice, but it's very hard on the device, all right? So you want to stay away from glowing plates. The center part that glows in the tube is called the cathode, and that's where the filament is. So every tube glows, and that glow that we see is that very center piece. So that is supposed to glow. That has to glow, or we won't have an electron flow. So what happens is, is that glow is created by this little filament right here, and then that heats up this cathode. So this filament is inside of this pipe right here that runs right through the center of the tube. And we can see that the pipe inside this rectifier tube you can see the filament strands down in the bottom and then there's the pipe and those filament strands go up and down inside of that pipe right in the center it's not touching the plate here but it's spaced away from the plate you can just see the top portion of the pipe poking out right there and then the filaments coming out of the top that's the cathode sleeve that's this thing right here that's what's supposed to glow all right that glows and that emits electrons so what ends up happening here is Again, if this goes positive, this starts to draw heavy current. So basically what it's doing is it's allowing a lot more electron flow. The tube will start to get a cherry spot in it, which again, in some cases is, you know, gives you a much warmer sound. And of course, what that's going to do is it's going to draw heavy current through the audio transformer and possibly burn out the winding in the transformer. Now, I know a lot of you that buy these old tube amplifiers say that, oh, they sound so nice with the factory capacitors. You open them up and in the bottom there's bumblebees or dye film caps or some dye film cap lookalikes. But if you measure the control grid voltage with just a, a standard DMM to ground, you'll a lot of the times see a positive voltage on the control grid, a, a very high positive voltage which is not a good situation okay so that's what's happening inside these capacitors they're slowly turning into resistors so you can picture a parallel resistor across this now for those that want to mimic that sound of warmth putting a high value say you replace this capacitor with something brand new like this is a very high quality capacitor and these things work very very well extremely low leakage very very low leakage if you were to take a resistor, a high value resistor, and put it across this capacitor, you would mimic what's happening inside this one right here, just by putting a resistor across it. Now, I've spent countless hours doing experimentation with this red plating tubes, burning them right up, running them right to the ragged edge. In some of them, I've even heated the tube up so much that I've melted the glass where the cherry spot is and uh, on the plate and uh, just countless hours of experimentation and looking at the results through an oscilloscope and even on an audio analyzer the audio analyzer that i use is a stanford research sr 780 and i also have the 785 and uh, one for sanity check and what i do is I'll, I'll experiment with these things and i'll load the circuits and just look at the way the audio changes through the tubes and take a look at the distortion present from biasing a stage up or completely removing the bias and things like that i can't tell you the amount of time that i've put into this trying to understand this and this answer that i'm telling you now is just plain and simple it's all it's doing is this stage the plate voltage on the amplifier of this or on the plate of this amplifier tube is being carried over this leaky capacitor into this audio output tube and what that's doing is it's driving this stage into heavy class a now there's a reason why musicians and audio guys like class a amplifiers because they draw current 360 degrees of the cycle 
Now, since this is driving, because of that leakage resistance across that capacitor, since it's driving this stage into such heavy class A, a lot of times it tends to make the amplifier sound very nice. Here's the key for a very short period of time before it burns the tube or the audio transformer out. Everything is in a balance. So too heavy into class A and you're coming out of that balance point. And there is your capacitor knowledge. I'll give you an example of what I mean by leakage here and also the outside foil end. When we take a look at these circuits here, the outside foil end always goes to the lower impedance portion of the circuit. So the outside foil end would go towards the plate. So if you had a capacitor here with a line on it, it goes towards the plate of the previous stage. Again, this is the shielded side, so, right? So this is shielded all the way to this end. So this lead is attached to the outside foil, which acts as a shield all the way up to this end of the capacitor. So the only thing that's exposed is this end right here. Now in high frequency circuits and RF circuits and things like that, that is very important to make sure that you have this orientated the right way. And in screen grid bypass applications where you say have a filament line or say this is connected to a very sensitive element, having you know twisted filament leads running even parallel to this or underneath it, it a lot of the times isn't good enough if these are installed the incorrect way. So if this was installed to the screen grid, to the screen grid of a vacuum tube, all right, in an amplifier stage or something like that, this way, this whole area of the capacitor is attached to the screen grid. And then this would just be attached to ground here. So if there's filament lines running underneath it like this, you can see what would happen. A lot of the times you'll get a mixing effect and you'll get a hum in your circuit. Again, countless hours of experimentation, and yes, it does happen. So for all of those People out there that say, oh, the outside foil end doesn't matter. They took the time to mark it on the capacitor. They put a line on the end. And in some cases, they're so specific that they even mark one end of the capacitor. Let's see if I can get this wax off of here. They even mark the line end of the capacitor ground, G-R-D right there where that line is, it's ground. So in any type of uh, an application where this would be used for bypass or in a sensitive audio application where this is going to a very sensitive portion of the circuit, they want this end to ground because this acts as a shield all the way up here. And how important is shielding? Well, you saw it in that radio. RCA actually wound an entire pipe of wire and put it over top of this capacitor right here to shield it. All right, now granted that end is running to ground, the one end of the uh, the pipe, of that coily pipe is running to ground, but if this was used in bypass, this end of the capacitor would be attached to ground. So this would act as the same thing, it would be shielded to this point. Very important to install these the correct way for optimum results whenever you're working on anything that has vacuum tubes in it or anything where you're dealing with a circuit that's, you know, got flying components like this and this isn't sitting on some form of a ground plane. I'll share some more capacitor knowledge with you and this seems to be largely misunderstood by lots of technicians, repairmen, even some engineers and you know hobbyists in general. So first of all this capacitor here is just one of the capacitors out of that radio receiver. I just randomly picked this and pulled it out of the pile. So this is one of those paper and foil capacitors coated in wax. Its rating is 0 0.003 microfarad or 3000 picofarad. The rating for the voltage is 200 working volts DC. At this end of the capacitor, you can see G, R, and D. That stands for ground. And there's this line here, which indicates the outside foil end. So if this capacitor is used in bypass applications, this side is intended to go to the chassis, as this would shield the capacitor right up to this point. And then you only have a short little bit of lead right here to go to wherever it needs to be going. And as you can see, they're already thinking that way. This is the lower impedance portion of the circuit, so it's okay to have a little bit longer lead on this end. If you have no choice, this is the end of the capacitor that you would have the longer lead on because it is the outside foil end. So now, a lot of people think that they can test these capacitors just with an ohmmeter. So again, I explained about parallel resistance being leakage, so you can picture a resistor across this. Well, if there's a resistor across it, can we not see that with just a standard DMM? 
So this DMM that I have right here measures up to 500 mega ohms. I'll just turn out the light here so we can not have a glare on the screen. I'll turn this on. Okay, and I'll attach this up to this capacitor here and we'll see what we get, okay? That's me touching it. So when I touched it here, I grounded it out. So you can see this here is very sensitive at 500 mega ohms. It's gonna take a little while for it to go up there. Even just moving the leads around will cause a shift because 500 mega ohms is way up there, half a gig ohm, okay? So as you can see, this is reading above 500 mega ohms. So you're thinking, wow, that's hardly any leakage resistance, right? So I'll get this out of circuit, shut this off, and let's test it for capacitance now. This is another thing that tricks a lot of people. And I'll explain why it tricks a lot of people. So I'll turn this light back on. So I'll turn this to right there so we can read this. This is 0 0.003 microfarad. So I'll clip this onto this end here and this onto this end here. Put that down. And as you can see, we're at 0 0.004 microfarad. So you may be thinking that, hey, this capacitor is a bit of an overachiever. It's a little bit better than, you know, it's, it's rating. So it's just a better capacitor. Well, that's not the case. What happens with these capacitor testers and many capacitor testers is it measures the amount of time it takes to charge this capacitor in order to give you a display here. So if it takes longer to charge this capacitor, we're going to get a higher reading. Well, why would it take longer to charge this capacitor? Because we have parallel resistance across it right now. So technically this is giving us an idea that this capacitor is leaky because it should be reading 0.003 not 0 0.004. So again, if we add any type of resistance across this, it's going to take longer to charge this capacitor up and we're going to get a higher reading. And in this case, that resistance is contained within this leaky capacitor because the paper has gone acidic. So that's the reason you get a little bit higher reading on these older capacitors. It's not because they're overachievers, it's because this is giving you somewhat of an indication that this capacitor could be leaky. Now here's the trick. Some capacitors are overachievers. And that's where this is not good enough to let you know for sure if it actually is leaky. So I have a capacitor that's close to this. This is 0.0047. So, or 4,700 picofarad. So this should read 0.005. It's about as close as I can get to this one here. So let's move this out of the way. Put that one on there. There you go, 0 0.005, okay? So newer capacitor, very low leakage. And of course, if I was to measure this on that other meter, it's going to measure way up in the mega ohms as well. I can do that just to make this fair. Click this light off here again. Get the horrible dusty look off my screen there. And I'll clip this onto here. And you will see how incredibly fast that just goes above 500 mega ohms, right? Okay. Now here's the thing. There's many tests for capacitors and a leakage test is just one of them. So this is testing for parallel resistance, not equivalent series resistance. An ESR test is completely different than a leakage test. Again, this tests for parallel resistance, not equivalent series resistance. A different test again. Lots and lots of different tests for capacitors. So what I'll do is I'll put this capacitor here into the test lead. So this is a newer capacitor, right? This is that um, very low leakage newer style capacitors. These leads are very rigid. So I'll turn on the meter here and I'll give you an idea of how this works. So when this is green, this is good. And you can see here this line or this LED level here indicates the maximum amount of leakage. And as this counts down, this is going to a minimum amount of leakage over here. This little LED just indicates the discharge. So what I'll do is I'll put this capacitor, the new capacitor in here and watch what happens. This is so sensitive that it'll sense me holding these leads. So even if I just pinch these leads together, you can see that's even through the vinyl boots. You can see that it's seeing the resistance through my body through this insulated boot. So what I'll do is I'll put this on here like so, let it go. Look at how fast that goes down. So again, I'll discharge it, test it again. 
All right, and if I click it on the forecast to forecast any future failures, no problems. Okay. Now what I'll do is I'll take this leaky capacitor, I'll put this on discharge again here, take this very leaky capacitor, and I'll put this onto the test leads. This one side here is being finicky. So there we go. So there's our 0 .003. Now watch what happens when I click this on. So as you can see, that is very leaky. Very, very leaky. So I'll open one end here. Okay. Clip that back on. And as you can see, this is indicating an extremely leaky capacitor. Now the 0 0.001 that I pulled out of there is leaky as well, but surprisingly, it actually let it count down on the scale. Usually these are so incredibly leaky that it won't even move. So let's try this out here. Look at that. Now, this is a good example of the forecast. So say you had a capacitor here and you're going, well, it's going halfway down. I wonder, you know, if this thing is going to be good. So if I click this onto forecast, if it goes back up to the failure point, we know that this is a bad capacitor. If it keeps going down, well, then we know in the forecast position, it's so incredibly sensitive that there's a good chance that this capacitor would be fine. So again, this way is up to the fail. This way is down to the good. So let's click this onto forecast. Well, obviously, we know that that capacitor is going to fail. So you can see... Definitely a bad capacitor. Surprisingly though, you know, it actually moved down the scale a little bit. 0 0.001. And of course all these other capacitors would be the same thing. So this is a 0 0.1 microfarad. So this is going to take a little bit longer to read because it's a little more capacitance. It has to charge this cap up to make it read. So I'll put that there. Let that sit for just a few moments. And you'll start to see it go down really quick here once the LEDs start moving. Again, it's just charging it up, and then there we go. No problems. And if I click that onto forecast, it stays green. LEDs don't go back up. We definitely know that that capacitor is good for the long run. Most modern capacitors don't have the outside foil end indicated on them for a bunch of reasons. First of all, most everything nowadays is on a circuit board and this can be placed on a ground plane, which acts as shielding. Not only that, in order to mark the outside foil end on a capacitor like this is a lot of extra cost in manufacturing because these things have to go down the line a certain way and then have this wrapped around with a band on one end. So you can imagine these things are being produced probably by the hundred thousands and they're just flowing down the line anyway and they wrap a, you know, an outer an outer cover on this and then print the ratings on it. So I found that many of these capacitors, this end is the outside foil and this end is the outside foil. It just depends on which one you pick up. Whereas in the old days, because these things were not mounted to circuit boards, it was very important to know the outside foil end because these things are often just flying in air, right? It's point to point wiring. So they mark the ground end and put a line on this in order to keep the outside foil end marked so you know. And of course, again, that is an extra cost. Well, this little device here is designed to locate the outside foil end on modern capacitors. So to give you an idea of how this works, this is a very sensitive audio amplifier, and these are the two test leads right here. These two LEDs switch back and forth. The LED that's glowing means that this lead, so say this is glowing green, that means that this lead is attached to ground, and then this one would be the sense lead, because this LED would be off. And then it would switch around. This one glows, so that means this lead is attached to ground, and this is the sense lead. So technically, this box is taking this capacitor and just flipping this around for you automatically. So it's just doing this, and then this, and then this, so that you can get a nice stable idea of what side is the outside foil end. So this is the sensitivity of the amplifier inside. This is an intensifier. This is explained on Patreon how the intensifier works, and it's for the smaller values. Just an on and off switch. Again. I'll get some artwork done for this thing down the road. It's I'm just so busy designing these things, these little projects and releasing them. I don't have time for my own artwork here. So be something like, you know, the Super Probe artwork or something like that. So I've attached this into the leads right now. And as you can see, this is the outside foil end. So the way that this works is 
the LED that glows, so this one down here or this one, whichever one glows with the least amount of LEDs displayed on the top is the outside foil end. So we're looking for the lowest amount of LEDs with the corresponding LED down here. So I'll just hold on to this here, try and get that out of the way so we can see all the LEDs. So there you see it. Now the sensitivity can be adjusted. If you want to get a full scale, I can also move my fingers back just a little bit on the body here. And as you can see, lots of LEDs, the least amount of LEDs. Lots of LEDs, the least amount of LEDs. So that means that this side here is the outside foil. So again, we're looking for the least amount of LEDs. I'll just flip this around to show you that it will indicate the opposite way. Okay, so here we go again. Most amount of LEDs, least amount of LEDs. Least amount of LEDs is the outside foil end. As you can see, the band end right here is attached to that side right there. Least amount of LEDs. And that's the way it works. So now keep in mind that you are the hum antenna. You are imposing hum into the circuit. So just by you holding this is allowing this thing to measure. So depending on your background and the atmosphere that you're around, sometimes standing up or, you know, of course, standing close to some appliances, something like this will make a much more sensitive reading. Again, you are the hum antenna. This is just reading the 60 cycles that you are imposing into the circuit. It's kind of like hoping, holding an open guitar jack. You know, it'll mm, 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 when you touch the guitar. Same kind of thing, except this is sensing that through the shell of the capacitor. And not only that, there's even a capacitor shorting that hum out across this all the time. So you can imagine how incredibly sensitive the amplifier is inside this to indicate that. So here's a more modern capacitor. It's 0.1 microfarad. Let's see if I can get a decent reading off of this. So you can see how well that indicates. So the least amount of LEDs is at this end here. So what I would do now is remove this. I know that this end here should be the outside foil end. So what I would do, let's turn this light on here, is take a felt marker and put a little dot on that end, just like that. And now I know that this end is the outside foil end. So when I mount this into circuit, if I was to replace this capacitor here, it would be mounted in circuit the same way. So again, this is available on Patreon. All the plans, circuit board layouts, drawings. Uh, the PCB layout is scaled and everything. Ready to print right off. Explanation, alignment procedure, all that kind of stuff is all available on Patreon for this thing. So these are just two of the devices that I've designed and released up there. There's a lot more, a lot more custom pieces of test gear as well. I have the chassis all cleaned up and I'm ready to install the dial back plate. So as you can see, there's four little punch marks here and that is for the alignment. That will allow us to align this outside of the case of the receiver because it would be very hard to do the RF alignment because some of the alignments are on the side of the radio receiver here. So that allows us to do a complete alignment with this thing on the bench and then we just slip it into the case and it's ready to go. So what I'll do is I'll get this mounted back on the radio receiver. We'll try this thing out, see if we can get any sound out of it. And if so, we'll proceed on to an alignment procedure. The dial back plate went on very easy. Just put the two screws in and I fed the string over this pulley here on the bottom portion, put the needle back on the track here, and then took the, the dial string, fed it around this pulley, and it was loose on the top here. So what I did was, since there's a spring on here to keep tension, I pulled the dial string down and popped it over this pulley, and there it is, just that simple. So very easy solution if you need to remove a dial back plate or something like that, just use some tape to hold the string in position so it doesn't completely unwind, and away you go. And this worked out so well that when this is fully meshed, right at the bottom, this is the bottom alignment point right here, that little line that's punched in here, the needle stops right on top of it. So I don't even need to move the needle or anything like that. It's 
perfectly in alignment according to the main tuning capacitor. Now that doesn't mean that the oscillator and the antenna section doesn't need an alignment. It just means that this is in the right position for the main tuning capacitor, which is kind of nice. So moving this is actually quite simple. So I'll just move this to the center here and I'll zoom on in just a little bit. So you can see back there, the string goes through the needle. So what happens is right here, this little area right here is a cup that faces up. This next one is a cup that faces down. And this next little area is another cup that faces up. And basically what happens is the string just goes through like that. So in order to adjust this, you just take the string on one side out of the cup and that'll allow you to slide this around to the right position. Then you just simply pull the string back over and put it back in the cup. It's just that easy. Now, some radio manufacturers make it a little bit more difficult. They put a little drop of glue on there to hold it nice and steady. But in most cases, you don't need that just because of the cups will hold it, you know, the needle perfect into the string. The string will not slide within the needle, I should say. So everything worked out very well. So again, here is that bottom alignment point. You can see that right there. Let's move it right down here. It's right there, no problems. So I don't even need to move that. Though this is another alignment point here for the oscillator and then so on and so forth at the upper portion here. I also put another little coating of white on the needle here. So what you see that isn't white is out of the viewing angle. You can't see that. So it's just this area. So it's a nice bright white needle now on this black background, which will make this look very, very nice behind that little piece of dial plastic or that little light pipe. So now what I'm going to do is clean the tubes up and get the tubes installed. So I'll just put this back in like so, so we can take a look at the chassis here. So I'll clean the tubes up, pop the tubes back in, and we'll see if the thing makes any noise, see if it comes to life or not. And if it does, we'll proceed on to the alignment procedure. I have the backside installed with the antenna on the radio and it needs to be installed to do the alignment procedure. So a few things worthy of mention, you can see that I've put some really large washers there and some large washers on the backside. And that's because I'm gonna be moving this around and I don't wanna rely on this back to be rigid. So by putting these larger washers here adds a little bit more surface area and there's less chance of this actually tearing off or anything if anything happens. So these are getting kind of fragile by now and just adding that extra surface area while the tests are being done is a good thing because you know I'm moving the chassis around and things like that. I don't want any damage to happen. Another thing is, is when you're setting this up, if you're going to do an alignment, you should set the wires up in a way that they're going to be, you know, or that they're going to remain when this is put back inside the radio. Now you can see this is the signal wire running right here into this antenna tuning portion of this capacitor here. And as you can see, it's up like this and it's spaced away from everything because this is a very sensitive area. I wouldn't want this pushed close to the chassis as to add any more capacitance. I want this to be as free as possible. And then the other lead on the bottom just basically ties to an RF ground. Now, when I say RF ground, that's different than chassis ground. You'll note that these capacitors have been stood up on rubber washers. Let's see if I can get a light in there so you can see the rubber washers. And a lot of the times, those rubber washers down in there, there's a rubber washer there, and there, actually, there's one there, and you can see the other ones. There's another two behind the lamp here. At any rate, those rubber washers, if they're decayed or crushed, they need to be replaced. They're in really good condition inside this radio receiver and there isn't a whole lot of spring tension with this spring right here and that's usually what causes the capacitor to shift or to squash those washers. So the rubber is still in very good condition so I could leave those there. Now this is isolated from the chassis and insulated from the chassis by those rubber washers yet if you were to take an ohm meter and measure from here to here it would measure a dead short. Now it's not okay to connect this directly to the chassis because this is an RF ground, whereas this is just a standard ground. So the reason that they stand the capacitor up on those rubber washers is so that there is that RF ground. So very important to know the difference between the two. 
Now you're thinking, you know, well, why not just run a braid from here to the chassis? Well, this has to ground at a special point on the underside of the chassis in order for the oscillator circuit to work correctly and not break into its own parasitic oscillations and things like that. So very, very important to keep in mind whenever you're restoring a radio like this. If those rubber grommets are bad, you'll have to remove the tuning capacitor and replace those grommets. So at this point, I'm pretty much ready to attach this to the isolation transformer and variac supply, attach up a speaker, just a test speaker to these leads, and see if this thing comes to life. I'm ready to try out this radio receiver for the first time. I've put the knobs on the radio receiver here just so it's easier for me to handle the controls. I have this radio receiver plugged into an isolation transformer and current limited variac supply. And what that does is that isolates this chassis from the mains. This is very important to have if you're ever going to work on an All-American 5 or All-American 6 type radio receiver or just any type of transformerless set in general. That's an extra safety precaution. If you're unfamiliar with what an isolation transformer is, I strongly suggest that you look into it. I've done some videos on that as well. Again, what it's doing is it's isolating this chassis from the mains. So many times, All-American 5 and All-American 6 type radio receivers have one end of the line cord attached right to the radio chassis. Now, if you recall, the factory line cord is not polarized, so you can plug it into the wall this way or you can plug it in this way, which gives you a 50-50 chance of making the chassis of the radio receiver live, which is very dangerous. So an isolation transformer is a definite must when working on any type of a transformerless set like this. So if you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. Know the risks and precautions of working with radio receivers and just circuitry like this. If you're unfamiliar with this type of stuff, definitely don't work on it. All right, so what I'm going to do now is turn on the isolation transformer and variac supply. So reach up over here and turn this on. I'm not sure where everything is situated. So I don't even know if this thing is on. I'll just keep an eye on those filaments there. I'm not sure, I don't think it's on. So what I wanna do is just center the volume control because I don't know which way is up or down on this. So I'll just put it in the center and this, doesn't matter, I'll end up tuning this. So this is off to one end. So obviously that is going to be on and I do see the dim bulbs glowing right now. So that did apply current there we go, you can see this lighting up here. I don't see the dial lights coming on. So obviously one of the dial lights is burnt out. So what I'll do is turn this off here and turn off the current limited isolation transformer and variac supply. And I'll just go over here, grab a couple of bulbs and change them. So here we go. Put up the box here. And pull those two out. Okay. So here we go. So these are the two new bulbs right here. Put those in. Hopefully I'll get a glow. This over here. This over here. See they're two different types that in. It's very common for these things not to glow. There we go. Out of the way. Okay, let's try again. Here we go. I'll turn this on. Aha! And those will get brighter as the radio starts to draw current. Okay. And I hear a bit of hum in the speaker. Test speaker is right off to the side here. And I actually hear, hear voices. Wow. That's really trying hard to receive.
not bad for the first, basically, first tryout. So obviously, forward is maximum. So I'm just holding on to this here and turning this up and down, just whatever way makes it louder and quieter. So forward is louder and that is quiet. So I'll have to remember that. And I can just leave that in that position there. I don't even need to adjust that. So uh, I can actually see if that tone control works. Yes, definitely. It's working. Turn the volume up just a bit. No problems. So I like the, the brighter tone myself. So since this is working, and it's working so well, just off of this little antenna right here, you know, in the depths of the Mr. Carlson's lab here, and it's right off this little antenna, it's picking up signals really well without any tuning or anything. And I imagine this is only running at a reduced voltage right now. Turn that up, and I'll take this out of current limit mode, and this will be full line voltage. Definitely picks up the receive, because it's got full B plus now. Wow, not bad. So nothing has been tuned at this point. Just basically, this is its very first try. So it can only get better from here. So now we'll go through and do an alignment procedure. The first thing that we need to do is align the IF or the intermediate frequency in this radio receiver. And then we can move on to the oscillator and antenna alignment. I'm ready to perform an IF alignment on this radio receiver. So I have my signal generator set to 455 kilohertz, and it's modulated by 400 cycle tone at 50% modulation. So the ground of my signal generator is attached to the chassis, so the RF ground from the signal generator goes to the chassis, and the signal lead goes to the RF ground. Now there's enough isolation between these two grounds, again this is an RF ground and a chassis ground, that I can get signal in here. The signal or the frequency that's being pushed through the IF section here is 455 KCs or 455 kilohertz. The dial is tuned to 1600 KC end of the dial or to a quiet spot. You can't see that, that's out of shot, but the needle is all the way over to this side here. The oscilloscope is attached directly across the speaker leads and I'm looking at the tone from the signal generator right now. If I had that speaker hooked up, you would hear a continual tone, a 400 cycle tone, which would get a little bit annoying after a while. So we'll just look at it on the oscilloscope. And what I'm going to do is just tune this section here for a peak. So I have to do the tops and the bottoms. So what I'll do is I'll do both the tops here on camera and then I'll do the bottoms off camera because I have to flip the chassis upside down and move everything all around to do that. But basically I'm just tuning for a peak with all four adjustments. So there's an adjustment on the top and on the bottom of this transformer, and there's an adjustment on the top and on the bottom of this transformer. Again, I'll just do the tops here to give you an idea of what's going on, and then I'll align the bottoms. So since this has been aligned basically, well, in the beginning, and it's receiving so well, nobody has really taken this thing incredibly out of alignment. So I can skip this first number one right here. So what they really want you to do is feed the grid of this tube here and align this one first so that you can get signal through. And that's usually when this is extremely out of alignment. So since this is very close to being fully aligned, I'll be able to get signal through the chain by just starting at number two. And as you can see, the signal is right there. So I'll just start at number two and I'll just align these like this. A little bit of a shortcut. So what I'll do is I'll peek this up here with this tuning tool, if I can get that into that little notch right there. So you can see it's pretty much peaked up already, not far off. 
So I'm just looking for maximum amplitude. So I want to get this as big as I can on the screen. And right about there is maximum amplitude for this upper one right here. So now I'll move over to this one here and adjust this one. Wow, that one's way off. So as you can see, lots of amplitude gain right there, and that's about the maximum. Now what I would do is go under the chassis and tune the bottoms of these as well. And then I'll, in the end, I'll go from top to bottom, top to bottom, and that's it. So chances are, I can turn the audio gain down here and reduce this, and I can also turn down the signal generator. I don't want the signal generator up too high, as so I get any kind of an AVC action going on here, so I'll be monitoring that signal generator as well. I managed to get this into the shot here, so I can show you the alignment on the bottom. So I'll just put this into the alignment point here, which is the bottom of that first transformer there. And as you can see, this is a little bit off as well. Right about there is peak. And now I'll move over to the other IF transformer and we'll see how far out this one is. A little bit, not too far off. So right about there is the peak for both of those transformers. And then what I'll go do now is I'll go back to the top, readjust the top, bottom, and then move over to the second one and go top and bottom just to squeak the last little bit of absolute gain out of this. Again, just looking for maximum amplitude on this. And then the IF section in this is tuned correctly for 455 kilohertz. That's it. Now, what we'll do after this is move on to the oscillator and antenna alignment. The next portion of the alignment starts right here at number three. So I need to feed a signal very close to this antenna here. And as you can see, I've just got the alligator clip from my signal generator close to the signal wire. And again, I have the ground, the RF ground of my signal generator to the chassis here. So it says here, short wire placed near the loop to radiate signal. And that's what this is right here. So I need to adjust 1620, it says minimum cap. So if we look on the diagram here, the last line is minimum cap. So that's this line right here. A little bit difficult to see. You can see if I cover the bulb there, that's 1620 right there. So I got to put that right on top of that. And I need to make sure that my signal generator is at 1620 KCs or 1.620 megahertz, if you want to shorten that up a little bit. So that's already set. So all I need to do is turn up the volume. And now I need to find that signal because it's not there right now. So what I need to do is move this around. The signal's there and it's supposed to be right about there. So that's right on top of that line. So I need to adjust C4, which is the oscillator adjustment, and C4 is this one right here, adjusted for 1620. So I'll take this tuning tool, and this is the adjustment right here, this little screw. So I'll move this around until I hear that tone. Just that easy. Just, just a little touch up is all it took. And right there. So now it says we need to go to 1400 kilocycles and adjust C2 the antenna. So 1400 is supposed to be this mark right here. So since we've adjusted this here, if I change my signal generator to 1400, we should get a signal right at this line. So I'll just change that right now. 1.4 megahertz. So now it's at 1.4 megahertz. My signal generator is feeding that in. So I'll move this down to that line. And there it is. So now I need to peak this for maximum signal. So basically I'm just looking for maximum loudness. And this is the adjustment right here. C2 1400. So that adjusts this antenna here. So basically we're tuning this. 
I can hear, you can hear it's getting quieter. Right there's maximum volume. Just that easy. I could put a scope on this and look at that at the speaker as well, but it's very audible. So, just turn this down. So you can really hear the difference in the audio. It's, you know, by moving it, I can hear the signal go down and come up and then go down and then come up right when I get to that point right there. So whatever you're comfortable with, you can also put a VTVM across the voice coil as well. So I wanted to do it this way so that you could actually hear it. You've seen it on the scope. This way you hear it on the speaker. So now the last adjustment that needs to be done is the 600 kilocycle adjustment here. So I need to adjust L3 and I need to rock the gang. So that means that this is, this is gang together. So I need to rock this back and forth like this after I tune this. So just basically to find where that's going to be because chances are it might be very tight down there and they tell you just to rock the gang back and forth. So I need to adjust L3 and L3 is over on the side of the radio right here. So that right there is L3, and that's what I need to adjust at 600. So I'll put this back down here again. I'll move my signal generator to 600 kilohertz. 600 kilohertz. And now I need to move this down to the second mark. So let's see if we can hear any signal down there. Very close, look at that. So I might be able to touch that up just a little bit. If I can grab this other screwdriver, I think the speaker is going to be in the way here. I just want to go in there, maybe this side here. There it is. Yeah, I'll just turn this up. So I'm looking for the deepest tone. So I don't know if you can hear this. See how it's going off frequency? That's the deepest tone right there, and if I pass it, it goes off again. So I'm looking for the deepest tone. And if you pass it, you can rock this back and forth until you get it right on the spot. Right there would be the deepest tone. Now the thing I want to do is check the dial alignment again. That's very important. Whenever you move anything, chances are it'll affect the other end. So. It was very close to begin with, so I imagine this is probably going to be okay. So I want to check this at 1400 again. So I'll just set the signal generator to 1400. Or 1 1.4 megahertz, and I'll just move this back up over here. And that's right on top of that mark. So there is no problems with the alignment there. And that's it for the alignment. So I'll get all of the signal generator, because the signal generator is swamping this thing right now. I'll get the signal generator out of here and get this thing put back into its case. And we'll take a listen to it, see how well it receives. I've removed the screws from the speaker and I also have to clean this out. We'll take a look at the speaker first. So I just simply remove them. And as you can see, the speaker is spotless. There's almost no dirt in here. There's a little bit of dust here, I think. A little bit of dust and debris there. It could probably get wiped out, but other than that, it's in very nice condition. The seam is solid. There are no splits to the speaker at all. So that is very nice. Now here's the thing. Speakers are screwdriver magnets. So once you remove the speaker, you want to put the speaker in a very safe area because screwdrivers will just randomly fly across the room and aim for the paper. So I'm going to put this right over here where it's nice and safe. 
where no screwdrivers can target it. So the case itself needs to be cleaned out as well, so I'll clean all this dust and dirt out of here. The dial plastic still isn't put back in, so I'll have to put that into the bottom there and just do a general wipe down of the inside. Then I'll put the radio chassis back in and we'll take a listen to this radio receiver and see how well it performs. Let's take a listen to this radio receiver and see how well it performs. So I'll quickly just scan through the band. Or more, that's an eternal investment. Meadows Way, 190. Because they make a real difference. And another reason, along South Owning Corporation, Equal Person Lender, License. Father, I have been this. I mean, it was a WWE. You're getting used to it. Optimism about the U.S. Yeah, safe for family. When you can't listen to traffic. Lots of radio stations in there. <laughs> So as you can see, there are a lot of radio stations in there, and it'll be a lot of fun to listen to some late night DX on this little radio receiver. It really pulls in the radio stations. So all in all, restoration successful. I'm very happy with the result. Thanks for stopping by the lab today. I hope you enjoyed this video involving this very interesting looking RCA Victor radio. It sure works well. I'm very happy with its performance, especially for just such a simple design. If you are enjoying my videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be more videos like this in the near future. We'll be taking a look at vacuum tube and solid state devices alike. So if you haven't subscribed, now would be a good time to do that as well. And if you want to be notified as soon as I post my new videos, don't forget to tap the bell symbol. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way, you're definitely going to want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I'm also sharing many of my personal electronic designs up there as well. So you saw two projects in this video that have been released on Patreon. The foil side tester and the low voltage leakage tester are both up there, among many other projects for you to build and take part in. It's a pretty neat place. There's a lot of really neat things going on up there. I'll put the link just below the show more tab with the official 2020 Mr. Carlson's Lab calendar link as well. So you can check both of those links out. And I may also pin the links at the top of the comments section. So until next time, take care. Bye for now.